We're going to be looking at the third of the 15 lessons that are involved in this series. And before I begin with the one that I'm talking about this evening, I've got a couple of things to say. Number one, that boy over there just finished is my son. There are not many like him. He is a hard worker, but above all, he is a great teacher of the Word of God, and I'm grateful for that. Second, it's a little difficult to start teaching a lesson by starting by confessing a mistake. I've told people before that I've made mistakes, but I only do so after I've said I've never made a mistake. And then I stand there and say, since the last one. Well, I made one today. I was working, thinking, and sort of going through what I'm going to say today. And something came into my mind, and I sort of turned away from what I had before me and went to my computer and started looking for some things. And all of a sudden, I realized that Eric wanted me to be at his house by X time because he knew what his duty was here today. And I recognized all of a sudden that I wasn't going to be there at that time. So I grabbed everything and I started running. Millie's not feeling well, but she knows me and she said, do you have this, do you have that? I said, oh yes, ma'am. And I got to Eric's house and he said, do you have those documents that you made to pass out to the people who will be here on your subject? I said, oh no, I did not. I apologize. I had made Earlier, I'd made 50, and I called Eric and asked if that was enough. He said, uh, maybe you need 70, so I did 20 more. And I still have every one of them. I will try my dead best to get my mind going and have them here for you next Lord's Day evening. With that said, the message today deals with baptism. How many know what that is? Oh, I expect every hand, yeah, every hand to go up. But there's more involved in all of this. All of these lessons have come out of thy word is truth. And those who know this congregation and especially know Eric know thy word is truth because he is the creator and the keeper dot com. dot com excuse me and all of these lessons are about these subjects and others but these are the ones that are in this particular section. And in all of the lessons, the questions that have come in, and there have been a lot of them, if you look at it, you'll see something called, I think it's questions and answers. There are 452 of them in thywordistruth.com. A lot of them have to do with baptism. 
And many of those that deal with baptism are trying to tell us that we don't know up from down and that we certainly don't understand anything about salvation. And a lot that is there is designed to teach what the Bible says about that subject. And the Bible teaches that baptism is essential to salvation. It's at the point of our baptism that we enter into the kingdom of God and that we are able to get out of the kingdom of darkness. It is at our baptism that our sins are washed away. It's at our baptism that we die to sin and are raised to walk in newness of life. And to reject these facts is to reject the Word of God. For those who may believe that they're saved apart before baptism, they need to read this information carefully because it is biblical information. So, with that sort of introduction, let's get to item, I guess you can say question number one. One we all know. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That verse is not hard to understand. It's very plain. It's very simple. For one who really wants to read it and receive it, There is no difficulty before them. There is nothing to stop them. There is nothing to enable them or cause them to misunderstand unless, as my daddy used to say, they need expert help, which means they need some of the preachers who don't believe that baptism has anything to do with salvation. It's still true that those who are baptized and believed will be saved. And what about those who only believe? Most of us are familiar with the book of James, and through that we know James. And James says that the people who believe that you are saved before you're ever baptized have much in common with demons who also believe and tremble. James chapter 2 and verse 19. But the question is, does baptism save? Well, we've got a good name. It's the name of Peter. And he's got a good answer to that question. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us not putting us away from the flesh, from the filth of the flesh, but the answer of, God, of good conscience toward God by the resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. That's clear. The only way you can go around it is to ignore it and to start making up things about it. Now, what we're talking about here are the things about what is right. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this section because I think there's something more important that I'll get to in just a minute. The second fact, those who are saying that baptism has nothing to do with Salvation say that baptism is part of every, uh, excuse me, we say, I've got ahead of myself, baptism is part of every conversion in the book of Acts, every one of them. And I'm going to give you just the passages instead of going over all of them. Acts chapter 2. 36 and 37 through 47. The one involving the Samaritans, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. Simon, Acts chapter 8, 13. That of the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 39. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48. Lydia, Acts chapter 16, verses 14 and 16, excuse me, and 15. The Philippian jailer, Acts 16, 30 to 33. Corinthians, Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And then finally, a man well known, Saul, Acts 22, verse 10 through verse 16. How can one say that baptism is not important when this book in which the church, the body of Christ, was established and which is the emerging history, the first history made by the Holy Spirit about the church and its creation and its continuance. And yet, in spite of all of that, many modern-day denominational preachers never even mention baptism. Is any more evidence required to show that they are not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ? I think that's plenty to show that they are not teaching the gospel of Christ. There was one denominational preacher who has published an outline on salvation that associates concepts about salvation with letters about alphabet. For example, in his line, there is an R. Figure what that means. It denotes repents. When you look at his list, you note there's something there that might, should be, but that doesn't appear anywhere in that that he has written and prepared to tell people about salvation. He skips right over the letter B. No baptism for him. 
question. Is that gospel preaching? Not in God's Bible. If for any reason we might think or might ask them to explain why it is so different from what we find in the New Testament. And I think they'd probably just turn and walk away for they have no answer. How do you reckon that compares with the Great Commission? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There was a book published back in 1936. I can remember that letter because that's the date it was born. The title was and is History of Denton County Baptist Association and the 60 Churches Within Its Jurisdiction. In that book, on pages 82 and 83, we find the following interesting account about Reverend J.B. Cole. Now, don't jump on me. That's what he was called. Not what I believe should be used. And I'll understand that and even tell you that sometimes there are some things that are used in brethren that I don't care for. Like when I was preaching, and I'd go out with some of the brothers, and we'd go have lunch, and there'd be one of their friends walk in, and recognizing him, he'd get up and say, this is Mr. So-and-so, this is Mr. So-and-so, this is Mr. So-and-so, and this is Mr. Hall. Why do they say that? Because he's special. There ain't no basis to believe that. So, as I read what I'm fixing to read, there'll be some more of that. But now you know how I think about it. But I'm reading the book, and this is what is found in that book on pages 82 and 83. An incident occurred in the Pilot Point Church during Reverend J.B. Cole's pastorate which involved a point of doctrine that subjected Pastor Cole to criticism and gave the incident much publicity and notoriety. Pastor Cole went fishing one day with a businessman who was not a Christian, and he availed himself of the opportunity to talk to the lost man about his unsaved condition and led him to an acceptance of Christ. Joe Ives, the man converted, said to Pastor Cole, Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Obviously, Brother Cole thought of the story of Philip and the eunuch, and taking the incident as an example, he led Mr. Ives out into the water and baptized him. Reverend Cole had been a Baptist but a short time and was not up on the conception of baptism and how and when it should be administered. The news of the incident soon spread around the members and then they 
show again. The following Sunday, Mr. Ives presented himself to the church asking membership, and his application was rejected, and he was hurt by the action of the church and turned to another church which readily accepted his baptism. The criticism of the pastor caused him to ask a committee of eminent brethren to sit in judgment upon his conduct. After reviewing the details of the incident, they wrote the church, advising it to drop the matter and Pastor Cole to go his way, but not to repeat the act. End. Now, I suppose that if it had something similar going on back in scriptural day and these folks were leading what was going, I suppose they would have given Philip the same warning about the Ethiopian eunuch and said, whoops, can't do it now. I got to find out what the folks are going to think about it. Not much care about what God said about it. The inscription in that book, by the way, is dated June 6, 1950. Has a name in it. Jess Hall. But instead of junior, it says senior. It was given to my daddy, that copy, for one of his friends who wanted him to use it in his teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The final line of the inscription in that book will scare you to death. Use this book in the interest of truth. We just heard a bunch of lies. In the interest of truth and condemnation of error. Well, that book's still around. When my daddy passed, it came to me. And sometime thereafter, because I wanted to stay in the family and I wanted it to be used well. It is now in the hands of Eric. So I know it will be used well. It has been used well. Now, with those things said, I'm going to turn over from a lot of information and not much time. And start in another section, and that deals with arguments against the uh, essentiality of baptism and why they're wrong in what they contend. Most denominations promote the theory that baptism is simply a sign or a symbol of the salvation that one has previously received through faith alone. That is, they argue that if you believe and are saved, then you will be baptized, even though Jesus said that if you believe and are baptized, then you will be saved. This view as with most departures from the Word of God is a fairly recent innovation. I guess it may depend on what you think is or is not recent. The understanding that baptism is the point in time at which bestows salvation 
at which God bestows salvation was the nearly unanimous view in Christianity for about 1,500 years. It was a consensus shared by the early church, by the early church fathers, by early Catholic theologians of the Middle Ages, and even of a man that you've heard of, but is not in the body of Christ, a man named Martin Luther. The other view was invented by a gentleman named Hildrich Zwingli, if I can misunderstand it properly. This came about in about the 1952s. You uh, may not have heard him or not certainly very much about him, but there is another fellow involved here that you probably have heard at least his name a great deal. And if you've been teaching or been reading a lot and some things, you may have some information on him. But uh, he stands at the lot of a lot of this stuff, and that name is John Calvin. It was Calvin's influence that this false view spread into the most modern denominations, and they now spread in most of the congregations of this world of any faith. So let's look at what they claim makes baptism unresponsible in salvation. Number one, they claim baptism is a work, and we're not saved by works. But I think everybody, including them and including us, all agree that no act of obedience has any merit in and of itself. No one will ever be able to earn his own salvation, period, paragraph, over. The power to save Man from sin is in the blood of the Son of God who came to the earth and at the will of God went to Calvary and to the cross and shed His blood for our salvation. We are saved by the grace of God. I've really not met anyone who believes that baptism is essential, yet who disagrees with any of these statements that we often are accused of saying saying that baptism is essential to our salvation and saying that our salvation is a free gift is not contradictory. There is no question that salvation is by grace through faith. Read Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. The question is not whether or not we are saved uh,
It's not whether we're saved through faith. Everybody agrees with that, okay? But you know what the important question is? When does that occur? When does it happen? Did I hear a second bell? All right. Who rang that bell? I want to shoot him. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, one thing you've probably learned by now is I talk slower than a lot of folks. I guess I'm just a good old Texan. And uh, that's just the way I sort of go at it because if I go too fast, then it's hard to keep up for me and I think also for people that are listening. So we will stop it here and I've got one more time and I'm going to do a lot of cutting between now and then uh, because I do want to finish. There are a lot of things in here and let me just close by saying the reason that I think that what we're doing here now is more important than talking about, well, do we understand? Because I think all good Christians understand. But as you and I go along and we have an opportunity to talk to those who have not had the opportunity to really sit down and understand what the Scripture says, then we've got to be in position to answer their questions. And that's what we're dealing with right now. When they ask the questions, do we, through the Scripture, have the answers for them? And if we don't, then we're ashamed, should be ashamed. So with that said, if you'll stand, we'll have our closing prayer.